Hey guys, good to see everybody again. Wait, that doesn't actually make sense because to me, you guys are everybody. And you can see me, but I can't see you. So what I should have said was good to be seen by everybody again. Nah, never mind. This here is the Bayrau HW35. It is manufactured in Germany, and it came to me by way of Air Guns of Arizona. And get this, this rifle has been in continuous production since 1951. And people are still buying this thing like crazy. And that has always been a bit of an enigma to me. So I am very grateful to have been able to spend a couple of days with it. I'm going to share with you what it is. And then I'm going to relay what I've learned about it and what makes it different than a regular brake barrel air gun and how that will translate to your ownership user experience, okay? So you're in the $510 price point here. Not cheap, right? You're measuring about 42 inches long. By itself, the gun weighs eight and a half pounds, and we'll get into why. With a scope, you're coming in at 10. It comes in a couple of different barrel configuration, or not barrel, but it comes in a couple of different metal configurations. This one is a stainless look. To me, it looks like it's anodized. It also comes in a deep bluing, which is like a black you get to pick. I think one's like, they're both in the $510 price point. So there's, it's not really a pricing difference. It's more of a look difference. The stock, guys, is not a Beechwood stock like you will find in a lot of the other Wyrows. This is actually a European walnut stock, not a walnut stained beechwood stock as you may see in some of the other ones. So it adds some heft, but it also adds some beauty and, uh, and some nice grain and some depth and color. So being of the 1950s and the design being largely unchanged, and there has been some variants of it over the years, there's a lot of vintage classic DNA built into this rifle, right? You know, you look at the stock itself, it's kind of short, it's kind of stubby. When you look at it from this angle, you'll see that it's got a cheek piece over on this side, but not on this side, right? It doesn't have like a real high comb like you see on the more modern rifles today. It's just kind of flat, which this is actually a real benefit when it comes to using these, uh, these open sights. A lot of the current Beemans and Byrows with this higher cheek piece here, it's really hard to get down in there and aligned, especially if you're a, uh, you know, a, a larger, a larger person. But um, some other things to point out that are pretty vintage is the, uh, the the cut here. I think they call it a finger cut. The checkering is actually hand cut checkering. On the bottom of the grip, you see like the vintage plastic cap, and um, you know, so it's just kind of got this old fashioned feel. The other thing that's old fashioned is I don't really see sling studs on brake barrels anymore, yet this one has it. It has one here on the back. It's got one here on the barrel. That's how it comes out of the manufacturer. They're set up for a three quarter inch strap, which by itself is kind of vintage. Most of us are going kind of, uh, kind of bigger these days. So, you know, it's a, it's a classic rifle and it definitely has like an old fashioned feel to it, but it, 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 it doesn't behave that way when you shoot it. And that was the thing that was kind of puzzling to me. You know, I had, I had what I like to refer to um, as negative assumptions going in. I'm like, you know, I felt like I was getting this dinosaur, but after spending time with it, uh, it really pulls some things off that are, that are in a lot of ways better, I have to say, which to me would warrant the price. You know, this is probably one to $200 more than your average good quality brake barrel, but you're definitely also getting some features in here that translate into a better ownership experience if those features are important to you. And, and we'll drill down on that here in a second. But like a lot of these Wyrows, you got a hooded sight up in the front. It comes with six different sight discs, one installed, five in the pouch here. The rear sight's adjustable for windage and elevation. Some interesting things going on here with the uh, with the engine. So it is a piston propel piston propelled coil spring brake barrel. But something this one does different is it has 
a significantly shorter stroke as far as its firing cycle than your typical Springer. The other thing it does differently is it, it uses a one piece cylinder. So if you look at the back here, there's not the traditional cap. There's not the traditional metal or plastic insert you'll see back there and a lot of brake barrels that's removable for easily, easy servicing of the spring and these kinds of things. And I don't know what that does other than uh, look better, but to me it really kind of brings out, you know, the thing looks like an old Indian motorcycle in my mind. There's just, it's just different and it's just better kind of in that way. Up on top are 11 millimeter scope mounts. Um, and let's actually, um, let's jump on the topic of scopes and barrel droop really quick. So over the years, I've been able to review about a dozen air guns. I got a question on Instagram actually a couple of minutes ago, just before I hit record, where a, a gentleman said, I don't understand this whole barrel droop thing with brake barrel air guns. You know, wouldn't that be cause for uh, a warranty and to send the gun back and get the thing, you know, warrantied out? And I don't know the answer to that, really. I, I, I think the answer is no. And the reason I say that is having put my hands on a dozen brake barrels over the years to review for you guys, Crossman, Hatsan, um, Beeman, Gamo, Sig, Diana, you know, all of them have had um, what I've measured to be normally between five and 10 inches of barrel droop on an ocularly centered scope on level scope mounts at 25 yards. So what that means is that when this thing is machined and put together, there's some downward angle built into the barrel. And um, last week, I, I don't know if I had a fluke or what it was, I'd love to get your guys' feedback in the comments on your experience with brake barrels and if you've actually done the work to do the measuring. But I had an R9 a week back that, um, that only measured two inches at uh, 25 yards. And if you look at these scopes, the center of the scope is about an inch or two above the center line of the barrel. So that's really no barrel droop. This one here measured 10, nine, it measured nine inches of barrel droop at 25 yards with this rig on it. This is a Virau scope. This is their fixed four by 32 duplex reticle. It's about a $200 price point. I was going to review this scope on this gun, but I've reviewed this scope on probably like three or four different brake barrels now. So there's plenty of information over on AEAC home, my other YouTube channel, um, on this scope. And when I measured that, that nine inches of droop initially, I thought to myself, well, wow, I wonder if my scope has gone bad or, or I wonder if there's that much droop, you know, in this gun. So what I did was, oh, by the way, these viral scopes are excellent. I haven't killed this one in, like I said, those three or four reviews, they also make a three to nine by 40. They're both adjustable objective. This one's about 200 bucks. That three to nine by 40, I think is about 250. You can also get them in Air Guns of Arizona. They've been excellent scopes for me. Long story short, I did not break this scope. Um, this one here is, this whole rig is what was on the Beeman R9 that I reviewed last week that I know had, was pretty much dead on with everything ocularly centered and leveled in the mounts at 25 yards. So I literally plucked it off of that rig, re-centered the scope, flattened out the mounts and set it up at 25 yards again. And I got 10 inches of <laughs> barrel droop. So I didn't break the scope. There's somewhere between nine and 10 inches of droop in this gun. But the takeaway is that's been my normal over the last three, four years, reviewing brake barrels, no matter the brand. There's usually between five and 10 inches. And so I'd be curious to know your experience because that's become my reality. So the good news is there's really easy ways of compensating for that. What you typically do not want to do is take something like this and at 25 yards, try to dial out 10 inches you know, of, of up because then what you're going to get is an erector tube inside the scope that is not very ocularly centered and held together by those springs that are in here, trying to hold it into alignment. It's really bound down in one goofy direction. So the scopes become less reliable as far as their point of impact at that point. And that can also bust them. 
really the better thing to do is invest in a set of adjustable scope mounts. I use Sportsmax, that's what's on here now. They have a one piece, they have a two piece that you see here. I've had a lot of fun um, testing this two piece mount. I, I wanna see how long it'll hold up. I got maybe 150 shots um, through it on the R9. I've got about 150 shots in it now on the HW35 here. Um, you know, so it's got 300 shots on it and they and it hasn't budged. It is rated for springers, um, but you know, I like to kind of test that stuff. You know, on the note of being rated for springers, this is a Hawk scope. It's an Air Max SF30 compact. You're at about the $350 price point with this scope. Uh, Hawk tells me it is springer rated. A couple of you have had a concern that maybe it isn't. So there was lots of reasons why to pluck this whole rig off of that gun, put it on this one, continue forward with the review because I wanted to see how good it would do. So, you know, we got like 300 shots through here and so far so good. And if these scopes are going to give up the ghost to a spring gun, they usually do it in about the first 100 shots or so. It's not normal to get it 500 or 1,000 shots uh, in. That's just less, less heard of. But with these adjustable mounts, guys, get this cap off here. You can actually see on the back here, I, I was able to raise this mount up, leave this one down, and that compensated and aligned the scope with the, you know, that, that barrel or however it was machined into the receiver. And by doing so, I could leave this scope at an ocular center. I'm not using the turrets to bind up that spring and crank on that, you know, to try to get the tube that's inside the scope to align with the barrel. I'm telling you that that'll cause you all sorts of problems. So by far the best way to do it is to invest in a set of mounts like this. They're like 60, 70, 80 bucks, something like that. They're not too terrible. If you don't have the money for the mounts, you know, and, and you're investing in a $200 scope, something more reasonable, just take like, um, you can do all sorts of stuff. Back in the day, we used to take 35 millimeter film and put a little piece, you know, under here to kind of raise the back up. You can, uh, you can, cut a piece out of like a plastic milk jug that works really good electrical tape works super good you just put a piece down there if one's not enough you can go two or to go to three you just don't want to get too crazy with that because you can wind up you're actually putting a bending force on this on the scope when you do that so this is the better way to do that um, but if you need to shim for some adjustment and then make up the rest with your scope it's certainly not going to hurt it to go a little bit you just don't want to go a lot of it because then you can damage the body of your scope and and you'll find that things stop working working as well but uh, yeah i'm excited to kind of continue on um, we'll get the gun out to 50 yards next week it's supposed to rain like every day we're in our rainy season now in florida so it's going to be a bit of a challenge but um still uh we'll, we'll try to do it now an another interesting i've been if you guys don't know instagram hooked on air is my facebook page or excuse me, my Instagram page. It's also my Facebook, Hooked on Air AEAC. And I'd like to bring you guys in on the discovery and approach as I'm doing in this video. And as I learn, I'm firing pictures up on Instagram with tech notes for you guys. And I brought the viewers, my followers on Instagram through my learning with everything kind of over the last couple of days with the HW35 here. And one of the remarks that somebody made is, geez, why is the barrel so short? or not the barrel, why is the stock so short? And again, obviously that's the vintage thing. Um, I have to tell you, it's nice and fat up here. Um, balance points right about here. And it's just, it's got kind of like a long rake here. So that might be better for bigger hands. I can reach the trigger, no problem. Mine are smaller, but this is a really nice lift and it's a really, really nice hold. So, you know, newer isn't necessarily better. Now, if this looks like a really short pull to you, check this out. So this is the Virau HW95 Luxus. What makes it the Luxus is it has this nice muzzle brake instead of the sights you see here. And um, there may be some upgrades in the checkering on the stock. I forget. It's been a while since I reviewed this. But, you know, both of these are about 42 inches long. And if you look at the length of pulls, they're identical. Now this is walnut stained beechwood, and you can see the difference between that and a European walnut stock. They both have a nice little rubber butt pad, but this is decidedly 
more narrow. It has more of a dainty feel. It has a long, slender feel. I can actually see a little bit of barrel droop in it as I'm looking down here. From memory, this one was probably five or six inches, but you know, it's just kind of the way they, they are. But you know, this is kind of your bread and butter brake barrel spring gun. And I don't really see any difference in the length of pull. Let's see. Yeah, the trigger, the, the triggers actually seems more set back on the on the 95 than it does the uh, HW35 here. So I don't know. I thought that was kind of a cool comparison. That 95 Luxus you can pick up at AOA too. That's where that one came from. I think we reviewed that. It's last summer. So check out AEAC Home if you want a full review on uh, on that guy. All right. So at this gun's core is something really different and I don't mean like the the one piece tube and the short stroke on that piston which creates a very short firing cycle uh, let me just show it to you that's probably the easiest way to do it <clears throat> so when we go to cock a brake barrel all of us know that there's a locking wedge or ball detent that lives in here that's that has that has like counter pressure on it by a spring and to overwhelm that spring to get the detent or ball to retract you got to give it a good whack up here and all of us know we've done that in the wrong place on our hand hands now and then and it hurts right and after a couple of hundred times on an afternoon you can get a little bit sore trying to overcome that all right, so what's really cool about this design, and, and I don't know how well you guys can see it, but draw your attention right here. I'll turn it sideways so you can see it. This right here is a little, this is your, your locking wedge detent. All right, and what's cool about this gun is this is sort of like a, I call it like a, like a stealth mode, soft break locking detent system. I made that up. I haven't read that anywhere, but to me that's like what it is. Cause it's gonna do a couple of different things for you. If you need to take a follow up shot in the field or if you need to cock your brake barrel, something they, do, they can be is noisy, which is not good when you're trying to get the, the feathered bad guy, right? And, and so, <laughs> here, let me just show you. So what you do is you push this forward. I'm gonna push it forward with my thumb. And I'm gonna bring a little downward pressure and you'll see how that barrel, see how that just kind of cocked forward a little bit? That's done the detent work. I'll show you one more time. Okay, do it, do it this way. Push forward and a little downward pressure and there it goes, all right? That's what the motion looks like. Now, when I go to grab this up here, I don't have to smack it. Right, just nice and easy like that because I've done the work by pushing that, and it's metal, that little piece is metal, and it's nice and grippy, and surprisingly, after about 100 and maybe 30, 40 shots, uh, was it yesterday? Day before yesterday, uh, I, my, my thumb wasn't sore, and I was sure it was gonna be sore. One thing that was not sore is this part of my hand from whacking that all day long. Oh, that sounded kind of dirty. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> All right, and yet here's the other cool thing. So there's a couple of ways to bring this back up. If you want it to be less movements because you're by yourself just shooting paper or cans in the backyard, just, just bring it up. But you heard that little clunk clunk, right? In the field, that's not always your friend if you want to be stealthy. So listen to this or don't listen to it. So I'm going to come up here. Right. So now we hunting wabbits because it gives us this really does two things for you. It gives you a silent way to operate that up and down of the mechanism. And it also is very kinder to your hand. Those are the positives. The negatives are if you're in your backyard, and you just want to shoot cans or paper. It's an added step. You don't just whack and pull. Boy, this is really getting nasty, isn't it? You don't do that, that, you know, that hit and stroke. Boy, there's no way I'm getting out of this one. I think you guys know what I'm saying. It's not that one movement. It's one movement. Or, here, let me decock it so I can show you. It's this. 
and then it's this, and then it's load, and then it's come back up, right? Or, because if you do this, ain't nothing gonna happen. So what I was doing was just doing that, doing that, putting my pallet in, and you can see the, you can see it right here. See that? This is a one piece metal dealio. And by pushing that forward, you're releasing, and it makes contact right here. That's just a little grease right there. Bam. So I have not seen that on any other brake barrel guys and maybe gals. And so I think that that step, there's three main things you're paying for with this. That's the first one. It's quieter in the field. It's kinder to your hand. Those are the benefits. The drawback is that it's an added step. Whichever is more important to you, that's how you pick your air gun, right? So the other big one was that short stroke. And this is the one that really took me aback. So it's got that mechanical coil spring that's propelling that piston. So it, 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 it had twang in the firing cycle, unless I kind of got that pellet in the 10 grain range. So I shot six grain through like 14 grain, and we'll get into all that in a minute. And in doing so, there was twang across the board. Not horrible twang, but there was some, there was some twang. But for some reason, when I'd load, load like a nine and a half grain, 10 grain, 10 and a half grain pellet, that was like some kind of sweet spot for this firing mechanism. And the first time I did it, I, I, I thought I broke the gun because it sounded exactly like a 22 rim fire short. It just went pop. It was almost like it was a, um, like a, like a nitro piston or a gas ram. You just kind of got that like snick where all you really heard is that, that piston and that seal kind of coming forward. So if you want to be super quiet and, you, and, and that twang bothers you, there's no reason to go out and, um, and get like a rebuild kit for this or get the, the components that'll help you get rid of that. Just shoot like a nine and a half grain to 10 and a half grain pellet, which it did very well with. And I think that is all attributed, I don't know, I'm not the engineer, but I think that's all attributed to that short stroke one piece cylinder design you're getting in this 1950s air gun. And so I kind of came away with that mind blown because I have never ever come across an air gun where once you hit a certain pellet weight, the twang just vanishes, completely vanishes. And I don't mean like a little twang, it was like snick. And I went, holy shit. So that was really cool for me. So there's a couple of big takeaways there. All right. Um, one and two. The third one was, I, I don't know if it's because, I probably should have told you. This is a 177, <laughs> guys. It's available in 177 <clears throat> and 22 here in the States. All the looking around that I did. Um, this one's a 177. I don't know if it's because it's a 177, but... Everything you see here, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve different types of pellets, it performed at the highest level that a brake barrel can at 25 yards. And to me, that's bizarre. Like, I have never come across that. So, I don't know if it's because it's 177 and the Germans really have the barrel figured out with that caliber, or maybe the industry really has the 177 pellets figured out with the air guns because that's a caliber that's been around the longest. I, I don't know, but that was kind of freaky. Everything you see here did extraordinarily well. Field target trophy, um, which is an 8.6 grain. The H&N sniper mediums, which is an 8.5 grain. The Barracuda... Hunters, which is a 10, uh, 10 and a half grain hollow point. Dude, this thing was flying with 13.43 grain JSB monsters. The original. It's getting dimers at 25 with these guys. Okay. The Expresses that we all know. The 787 did great at 25. 
and the JSBRS, which was a phenomenal palette in the R9 last week. A 7.33 grain. Awesome at 25, all right? But then, for some reason, this little five ring, this kind of took the whole thing up a level. I don't know if maybe I just got lucky on these five or luckier than these six, but these guys were just like, you know, like fingernail size to smaller than a dime at 25 by five shots. Both of the Air Arms variants. If you guys don't know this, JSB makes rebrands a lot of their stuff for a lot of different manufacturers across the air gun industry. But that is not the case with the Air Arms stuff. Air Arms is the, and I verified this when I went to the Czech Republic and toured that factory, did the factory tour video for you guys of JSB over on AEAC Home, verified that with them. Only Air, Ar Air Arms has their own die at JSB. And then the only pellet manufacturer that has their very own die. Everybody else is kind of like on the die rotation, if you will, so, which is why you see variants in those pellets over there. So by die rotation, I mean, you get a new guy, a new die, it runs its course and, or life, and then they swap it out. And the pellets just change ever so slightly through the lifetime, which is why we get different accuracy in different tins, all out of the same brand of pellets. But, but for some reason, it loved these air arms. 10.3 uh, grain, 8.4 grain, studly at 25, all right? And then separate from that, the HW35 was having a serious love affair with the H&N Barracuda variants for me, all right? And, well, actually, that's a field target trophy. We'll get to, we'll get to that. So this is a relatively new palette from H&N. It's called the Barracuda Field Target. It's a little bit lighter weight than the regular Barracuda, and I suspect... It, it might be kind of like a Barracuda match where the, the sizing of them. I don't know that for sure, but the sizing of them may be a little bit more uniform. But 9.57 grains. Loved, love, love, love these things. I love the original 10.65 grain Barracuda. And it loved the Barracuda green. This is an alloy pellet. It's made of tin. Um, if you want the speed out of it, this is your bad boy right here. And it loved the Field Target Trophy Green, which is another alloy tin pellet. 5.56 grains, 6.48 grains. If you want flat and fast, that's your pellet. So speaking of speed and, and some of these other things, power. For me, this was an 11 to 12 foot pound brake barrel. It was 875 feet per second with a 650 the 600 870 let's try that again 875 feet per second with a six and a half grain pellet it was 690 feet per second with a nine and a half grain pellet okay 11 foot pounds 12 foot pounds just depending on where you are in the extreme spread extreme spreads were 10 12 ish with lead 30 ish with alloy tin and that's actually the second time i've seen that so i'm going to call that pattern now these barrels just don't seal quite as well with the alloy tin pellets, but it does not matter when it comes to accuracy. 10 foot per second extreme spread, 30 foot per sec second extreme spread, does not matter at distances like 25 and 50 yards. It's not gonna change your, your point of impact. So if you need something that where backdrop is a concern or you're worried about toxicity, this is not like, to me, this is not like a, a default anymore. I'm like starting to like go to to these things and I'm having good luck with um, uh, the Predator GTOs as well. This gun didn't like the 177 GTO because it's like a wad cutter where in the 22 and 25 it's a Diablo shape. So yeah, I don't know what the uh, what the deal is with uh, with all that. But yeah, um, just been a very interesting eye opening couple of days learning with this guy. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to decide if I want to, if I want to declare a feeling yet. I'm having some feels. Can you see the feels? <laughs> having some feels. Having some, I don't know what I like better. I really don't. Like something like this is really nice because you can just kind of 
do this all day long, you know, for a reviewer, that's nice because um, they don't have the extra movements in there. But, you know, it kind of it can beat up the hand a little bit over time. But I know that in the field, something like this is certainly stealthier with that locking mechanism. And it doesn't beat up your hand. So, I don't know, guys. It's a toss-up. It's really, it's like, what do we say about all air guns they're, and all ammos? They're, they're tools to fit the, uh, the job that you want to accomplish. There are arrows in your quiver. You deploy that one, you deploy this one, this pellet, that pellet, just depending on what it is that uh, you want to do. But one thing's for sure, I am very, I am very uh, surprised and smitten with this setup. And um, there's definitely things I like more about it that would justify the price tag. The, the barrel versatility, the stealthy breech here that doesn't beat up your hand, and that short, that ultra short firing cycle that loves that nine and a half, 10, 10 and a half grain pellet, where it's goofy, man. I, I'm sure it'll come out in the full review. You guys will not hear that twang. You're just gonna get that snick. And uh, so I'm excited to share that with you. So with that, guys, it's the holiday weekend. We got Memorial Day coming up, and I've got things to do. You guys have things to do, I'm sure. Florida's opening up. I hope where you guys live, it's opening up as well. So we're going to get out and, uh, and enjoy our weekend. So with that, wherever you guys are, whatever you're doing, I hope this video has brightened your day a little bit and enlightened your world, taught you something a little bit new. And, um, and I will see you hopefully in a week or so on the primary YouTube channel, the Airgun Exploration and Advancement channel, or AEAC Home with a full review, 25 yards, 50 yards, bunch of different pellets, sound, trigger, you know, some other goofy things like that, more shot charts and what have. So, yeah, see ya. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later. <laughs>